Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for having me. I actually really, really want to thank the organizers, uh, Sergio, Pablo, Ariel. Um, it's actually, I've been dreaming about coming to Uruguay for about 20 years now, so I really want to thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to come here. I'm really, really honored. Um, so anyways, um, I'm going to give a very, very quick presentation because I think I'm the last one before your beers and the rest of the networking. So I'll try to keep this hopefully as short and sweet as possible. And so what I'm going to talk a little bit about is what I call the future of work. Um, and this is actually something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, I've been very, very fortunate in my career to spend a lot of time traveling across the globe. I've worked in a lot of different sort of roles. And one of the things I see that's universal across the entire globe is actually the importance of work, of work in your identity, work not just making income, supporting your families. Um, and we see that it's actually changing a lot. Um, and so let me just jump into this. And so I'm giving you sort of my Silicon Valley as well as sort of hopefully somewhat well-traveled Silicon Valley view on where the world is going from a trends perspective and then how to thrive in this time of sort of massive change. Okay. So who am I? And I'm sorry for this slightly douchebaggy sort of like picture. I didn't realize it was actually like, yeah, it looks really douchey, so I'm sorry. Um, but you know, who am I? Why am I qualified to sort of speak to you, this esteemed sort of group? Uh, you know, number one, I'm a partner at 500 Startups. I've uh, been there about three years now. I've actually lived and worked in Silicon Valley now for about 17 years. And so 500 Startups have been there three years. I run the San Francisco office. And I've actually invested in the last three years close to 250 companies. And so, you know, you're an idiot if you actually don't learn anything from doing that, right? Um, prior to that, I actually spent, um, you know, when I first joined, um, went to Silicon Valley, I actually spent two years at an e-commerce startup that raised about $30 million. I was a very, very early employee and ran marketing for them. Uh, got laid off like everybody in 2001 and then ended up joining a company called Yahoo. Um, and I spent about 10 and a half years um, at Yahoo actually as an executive. And so I can pretty much train anybody here how not to run a company, right? So that's, I'm really, really good at that. Um, and so, you know, I've seen a lot of stuff, um, traveled around the world, done a lot of operational, sort of had offer experience at a early stage startup, had operational experience actually at a large company, and now I'm doing the investing thing. And so see a couple things along the way. One of the things I see, um, big, big changes over the last couple while, is like what I call like the fall of big corporates and big everything. If you take a look at the standard and pores of just sort of the lifespan of actually a lot of corporations, it's gone from about like, you know, 60 to then it's like 40 years, and then on average now to about 15, 16 years. And what's happening is just, you know, you're seeing a lot of these companies, really, really well-known companies dying and disappearing. Why is, that, why is that happening? It's happening because you're seeing these waves of change actually happen much faster than before, right? Driven by a lot of different sort of trends. And so what I've seen is that in Silicon Valley, I've been here 17 years, I see these like five-year cycles. And with each of these cycles, in the beginning of the cycle, you see a lot of new emerging players sort of come out, and you see a lot of the old established players slowly get killed off or move into obsolescence. And so I'll give you an example of how I think about this world is, you know, so you look at 1996 to 2001 was the age of portals. You saw companies like Yahoo and AOL become very, very dominant. Then from like about 2002 to about 2000, I'm gonna say six, the age of search. Obviously the big player that came out was Google, right? Google came around, just kicked our ass, right? When we used to be dominant. Then you basically see from 2007 to like 2012, social, the age of social, which companies actually came to become very, very dominant. Facebook, right? Facebook, take a look at other companies like Twitter. Okay, used to be dominant, maybe not so much anymore, but you're seeing these changes, these big players come out, and then all these previous players start to fall behind. And now, you know, if you take a look at from, I'm gonna say like 2012 to like 2017, what everyone hears about is this age of mobile. And so for example, you saw the re-rise of Apple with their Apple App Store. And this is one of the things I was asked to sort of talk about, like what true innovation is. The, I'm very, very lucky to actually be based in Silicon Valley because we're seeing a lot of these trends emerge from the beginning. And the challenge of sort of being in countries very, very far away, being in early, early ecosystems and not necessarily being super close to Silicon Valley is that a lot of the things that you read about in the news and the press, it's actually too late. And so I hear a lot of companies going like, I'm releasing this app and this is my idea of innovation. That's not innovation. You're actually four or five years behind already. All right, so I, you know, what I think about innovation, you have to be very, very careful about like what you're reading in the newspaper. The media is always the last to know. So when you're reading about it, it's too late already. Right? 
Sorry, sorry to all the media people in this uh, room. Um, but anyways, and because of these massive changes, you're seeing these continual companies that used to be very, very dominant. And I use my own story where I remember when I first joined Yahoo, like you're so proud about like, I worked at Yahoo, look at how awesome I am. And near the end of my career, like watching like after 10 years, like people ask you, what do you do? You're like, eh, I work at this internet company and then you just don't say anything else, right? It's just like the very rapid decline of what used to be very, very dominant companies. And why is that? Because big is dumb and slow, all right? And you see this on a regular basis. And I use this, you know, it's not just companies, right? It's any organization, it's governments. And so if you take a look at, let's just even use like the government example. If you look at the most innovative countries on the planet right now, they're not the big countries, right? Russia's not going anywhere. Think about like China and India are disaster. And look at the US, right? And this is my country. What a mess. We voted that moron. I'm sorry, I'm not going to talk anymore about that. But like, look at the disaster zone. It's actually turned out. Where the innovation is actually happening is in countries like Israel, right? Small country. Estonia, small country. Um, Singapore, small countries. Sweden, small country. There's, you, you sort of see this pattern. Portugal. Super interesting things happening in Portugal right now. And it's because you can learn very, very quickly and you're not bogged down by the bureaucracy. And that's the same with large companies. And, and this is something I see over and over again because they aren't able to react to these outside forces. And so they're already facing a lot of big macro changes that they have to adjust to. And they can't because they're big and stupid. Right? Um, the other thing that's actually happening that they're being attacked, startups, right? So between 19, you know, when I joined 1995, 2015, see the huge decline of actually cost of, of running a startup, literally a hundred X decline of startups. And so think about that. When I was at my first startup, right? Raised $30 million, 15 million was going to buy hardware and actually going and renting space. And then this wonderful thing showed up, Amazon Web Services and Cloud Services, don't have to spend that money anymore. Same thing with advertising, where you have to spend a lot of money in offline advertising. Things like Google AdWords and Facebook did not exist. That's relatively inexpensive. And so I don't have to rely on that anymore. I use like, you know, where I have to go and buy TV ads and other of that BS, right? That doesn't actually work. Um, and so all those costs are going down. And then what's happening is you're starting to see these rise of these startups where you're seeing these elephants being eaten by ants. And so that's literally what's going on. And that they're having a hard time reacting from these threats too. And so, this is a quote, this is a long quote, but I'm going to read it out because I think it's important. Cory Doctorow, he's an author, he said, the days of companies with the names like General Electric, General Mills, and General Motors are over. The money on the table is like krill, a billion little entrepreneurial opportunities. I'm going to read that last part again. The money on the table now is like krill, a billion little entrepreneurial opportunities. And so it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. One of the, these are two books. I'm going to recommend a lot of books in this, um, you know, in this presentation. Um, these books changed my, my, my life and how I looked at sort of where the world is going and thinking about trends. Um, End of Jobs, the, the Fourth Economy. So if you think about, like, if you believe everything I said earlier about the fact that big companies, big organizations are under dire threat, what happens when these companies are under dire threat? And what's the biggest cost structure for these big companies? What is it? It's people and salaries. All right. And so what do you do when you're under threat? You cut your costs, right? And you cut people. How many have you actually heard about these stories of like Intel laying off 20,000 people, IBM laying off 10,000 people, go down the list, right? 10,000 people, people who are actually reliant on the incomes for their families from these companies. And why is this happening? You know, when they're cutting costs, what are the two things that you look at? How do you cut costs, right? Those jobs still need to be done. You invest in AI, automation, software. Right? And then I had an investor friend, he's like, I only invest in companies that eat people. And I'm just like, well, what does that mean? Is that companies that actually make jobs and people disappear. That's, and that's actually what Silicon Valley does, right? For better or for worse. We invest in companies that actually, software, software that actually does the job better than human beings. The other thing that's actually happening, if you can't use software, you outsource it to places like India or other places like Eastern Europe because it's just much cheaper. And so that's actually what's happening. That's what's responsible for all these layoffs and these firings across companies, large companies all across the world. And this is the reason for this, what I call like the death of middle class jobs, right? You know, that old path, you know, and the things that your parents, the things that I grew up listening to, you know, 
go to get, you know, get good grades, go to good university, then get a job at a big company. All that stuff is obsoleted. And so if you think about like all these roles, lath operator, bank teller, travel agent, interesting one, truckers. Do you know in the US there's close to three million truckers that are actually, that, that's their job, right? And now, like I think this was really announced where Auto is a company, OTTO, it's a company that's actually owned by Uber. They actually had the first time where they actually had a trans sort of like, you know, continental sort of truck go from the east coast to the west coast, automated, no driver. Think about the ramifications. That's going to be three million people without jobs in the next 10, 20 years. What are these people going to do? This is a massive, massive change. And these are not the only people. You're not worried about truckers. Lawyers, right? Software is going to do a lot of work better than lawyers. A lot of traders on Wall Street. Every single role, as you start to see these advances in, in sort of what we call like AGI or AI, right? Um, you know, artificial intelligence, applied artificial intelligence. Um, you know, there's a lot of technologies coming down that are actually going to do the job better than humans. Same thing on like manufacturing jobs, right? The dirty secret in the U.S. is that U.S. is actually the second largest manufacturing country on the planet behind China. And yet, a lot of those factories have come back. The jobs have not come back because it's all run by robots. And that's the dirty secret. It's not because we've outsourced or it's because of immigrants and all that BS that was actually spewed out during the, politi the political campaigns. It's robots and automation. And because of that, this requires a massive, massive shift in, your, in your, your brain, right? Because you have to sort of lose this employee mentality, I'm going to get a job BS mentality. And so that's why I'm going to quote Jay-Z, right? Love Jay-Z. It's like, I'm not a businessman. I'm a business, comma, man. You think about yourself like a business. And this is, requires a major, major mindset change. If you don't do this, you're dead in the next 10 or 20 years from an economic perspective. And, but yet, you know, I'm optimistic. So yes, there's these big, massive changes that are going on, but there's huge opportunities, right? You've probably heard this, you know, the idea of just like the same word, like crisis and opportunities, the same word in Chinese. I firmly believe this. And so here's why it's actually a great time to be an entrepreneur, to have, whether it's to be an entrepreneur or to be entrepreneurial, you can still work at a big company and be entrepreneurial, all right? One of the good things, the rise of these platforms and sort of global distribution, right? You know, let's just say, like I said, app is not necessarily super innovative, but think about it. You can be in Uruguay now, launch an app, and actually reach over like hundreds of millions of people across the world, right? Or if you want to actually launch a new product or, or you know, consumer product on Facebook, you reach over 1.5 billion people across the world. There's all these platforms now where you can actually reach a global audience. This is very, very good, all right? The other thing, niches, right? Because now you can reach, like I said, Google, several billion people online. Facebook, almost probably close to two billion people. Apple App Store, hundreds of millions of people. Pinterest, hundreds of millions of people. I think there are like about 80 or 100 million, million sort of monthly users. But now you can actually reach a lot of people and reach specific niches. I care a lot about niches. If you're trying to find where the old days, like when I was first starting off, there weren't that many people online. Now everybody's online. And because of the immense, amazing targeting that's available to us now, you can actually target you know, what is considered a small audience, could be very, very big, and actually make yourself a good business. Um, there's a very, very famous writer called Kevin Kelly. He wrote, um, he's like one of the founders and main editors of Wired, and he wrote this amazing blog post called A Thousand Raving Fans. And what he found is that if you have a thousand raving fans, a thousand raving customers, you can build yourself a good, sustainable business. Um, and that's the same. You look at bloggers. They're only relying on about 1,000 fanatical customers, and you can build yourself a good business. And that's the same for, for any other industry. Other great things. Knowledge is everywhere. So there's amazing courses, like um, you know, full disclosure, Udemy, where this is an investment of ours, but like edX, Coursera, like all the things that you want to learn, whether it's programming, online marketing, um, anything to do with like fitness or health, like, Every type of class, anything you want to learn, you can actually go do this online. And it's not that expensive. Where well, you want to learn SEO, SEM, how to run Facebook ads, whatever the thing is, you can actually go online to learn this stuff. And it's a huge opportunity for all of us. Um, and I'm super excited by this space in general. Maker movement. 
one of the things I see a lot is just like you're starting to see, which is ironic when you see this growth of digital and digitalization, you almost see this counter to the human movement to sort of like actually making things. And now because of a lot of the tools and things that are available, like there's this a maker, you, um, sort of this maker sort of movement where a people making their own furniture, um, for example, crafts, right? And wonderful platform, a platform like Etsy, where if you like crafts, you know, you're starting to see these really interesting boutique businesses coming out where they're basically like, you know, people at home knitting or making these things and selling on Etsy and making great livings by doing that. You know, the maker movement is something you're seeing a lot of. People making furniture, people making whatever, hardware products. Um, this is something you're seeing emerging as well too. And this excites me about sort of like, you know, this, this movement in my opinion is going to sort of also provide opportunities for people. Um, one of the things you probably see a lot of is like digital nomads. For anyone who actually knows me very, very well, this is a space I've been interested in for the last four or five years. And this idea of digital nomads and geo-arbitrage. So I have a lot of friends, um, and they're basically like, you know, programmers, um, online marketers, and what they realize is like, wait a minute, why am I spending all this time living in a super expensive place like San Francisco or New York when I can actually go and live in Thailand and still earn US dollars and euros in this very, very low cost, relatively low cost geography and still have customers from the US, whether it's in running an e-commerce business, being a programmer, being a consultant, and basically doing the geo arbitrage. And that's also one of the things that's also great too. There's so many really, really awesome software companies here in Uruguay, same thing with outsourcing, right? The same thing with like the software companies I see emerging here of just like being based in Uruguay, cost structures lower, but you're earning US dollars and euros and wherever. Um, and one of the things that's actually interesting is just that you can actually build fairly large businesses, five people businesses, 10 people businesses in these different cost structures, whether it's in Ukraine, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, Latin America, um, you're seeing this sort of geo arbitrage actually you know, sort of like become emergent. I went to a conference last year called the digital, uh, Global Digital Nomad Conference. There were 600 people there. So this is a real thing. And a lot of these people are actually leading the edge in regards to how they're using technology. And I actually think that like, this has become more and more prevalent and common over the next five to 10 years. So opportunity. The great news too, this, there's books that actually tell you how to do it, right? Everyone knows, has everyone heard of Tim Ferriss, right? He wrote his book, The 4-Hour Workweek, probably about 2006, 2007 is my guess, right? It's been around for a long time. Like, and, you know, these books sound like a little bit sort of like late night sort of like ad version, but like they're very, very good books and they provide roadmaps if you want to build these type of like lifestyle and build these type of businesses. So a couple key lessons, I think sort of through, you know, if you believe anything I say through the rest, you know, through most of this presentation, a couple rules in my opinion that you need to sort of thrive in this new world. Number one, learning is earning, right? And I, I, I it always shocks me when I meet these people who like, Think like all the learning ends once you leave university. If that's your mentality, you don't deserve. You're a pinero. That's like the one word I learned in Spanish, right? Like you're a pinero. You will have no right to exist in this ongoing world. Learning becomes incredibly important for you. And I invest tens of thousands of dollars every year in my own sort of education. I read a lot of books. I go to a lot of workshops. I take a lot of classes just to keep up with the stuff that's going on. I'm taking an edX um, class from like MIT on like biotech. Um, because like these are things that you have to keep yourself raw and fresh to keep up with the trends that are going on. Right? The other thing, the network is your net worth. Really, really important in this age and much easier with tools like LinkedIn and Facebook because a lot of the people that you meet are the people that could be your potential partners, could be your potential clients, could be companies that you're going to invest in, potential investors. And this is actually the key to success in Silicon Valley is your network is the most important thing, right? Think about these things like the PayPal mafia, the Google mafia, the Facebook mafia. These, these are very real things that allow you to get new opportunities. Niche to win, I think I've sort of said enough about that, but really, really important is just to focus on one small area. Even though it might look small, you can still build really interesting businesses with niches. And what there's this great saying is that if you try to serve everybody, you serve no one. And that's a failure, like the focus is actually really, really important. Okay, um, side projects. You know, if you talk to anybody in Silicon Valley, like everybody has a side project, or, and these become what they call side hustles ways of making money on the side, right? So you have people working at startups, they're angel investing on the side, or they're doing projects on Upwork. Everyone on my team 
has side projects. They do speaking, they do paid speaking, they do consulting. And this is something I encourage because this is a way sort of to learn new skills. And that's the same goes to number five, is building a portfolio of skills and building a portfolio of incomes. You know, if you look at sort of, if you do studies on sort of the most wealthiest human beings on the planet, they have at least seven different forms of income. And part of it, if you believe everything I say, where we're entering this world that's gonna become more and more complicated, we could lose your job any single minute, you need to be reliant on different income streams instead of being reliant on one income stream. Really, really important. Last of all, is be notable and not credible. In this world where there's a lot of people competing, it's really important to stand out. So thinking about your personal brand and also the way I think about it, where it's like, it's better to be like good in two, you know, the top 20% of two or three areas. I read this from a guy named James Altucher and I had to think about this. It's better to do that, so you actually put a bunch of different things together than to be the top 1% of one thing. By this mixing, allows you to be unique and have different skills and actually help you stand out in the market. And so thinking about your personal brand and the skill sets and the skills portfolio that you're building is really critical. And of course, this is not easy, right? This all sounds like simple, it's not. But in line with sort of what Tim Ferriss said, you know, the more voluntary suffering you build into your life, the less involuntary suffering will affect your life. And I think there's some truth to this, right? Because you're, by embracing a lot of these challenges, you're preparing for the future and making yourself more anti-fragile. But if you do this, to quote Eleanor Roosevelt, this is one of my favorite, favorite quotes, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. And I actually think if you follow these things and you follow these rules, it will enable you to get to your dreams faster, whether it's more money, to spend more time with your family, freedom, impact on your society, on your friends, hopefully positive impact um, on everything around you. I hope that this will actually help you think about ways of getting there. So thank you very much for your time and I hope this is very, very helpful. <laughs>